Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming veteran character actress Pam Hyatt. Pam, of course, got to be in three cult classic movies in 1986. She was in the horror cult classic Killer Party, Police Academy 3 Back in Training, and... She got to do a voice for the Care Bears uh, 2 movie, the Care Bears movie 2, A New Generation. And uh, she's been in lots of other things. And um, she's, I'm sure she's got a lot of stage credits I'm going to ask her about today. And uh, she's the mother of Zach Ward, who played Scott Farkas in A Christmas Story. He was on the show a couple years ago. It's going to be an honor to talk to her today. And, yeah, I remember when she was in Police Academy 3, she's trying to make a woman out of her, out of her daughter. And she, uh, uh, she, uh, takes her over to Callahan and Callahan says, by the time I'm through with you, you're going to have brass balls this big. <laughs> it's, and her, her face is so priceless in that scene. And I got to bring that up today. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Pam Hyatt. How do you do, Tommy? Hi, Pam. Welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm very, very well. Thank you. I'm just going to put you on speaker so I can be hands-free. Oh, I wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure. My pleasure. What can I ask? answer for? What would you like to know about Pam Hyatt in her many years, 63 and a half? Almost 64 now. <laughs> Here, in the business, yeah. So, going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? It sounds like you did. Yes, I did. Uh, I'm from Garden City, Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. um, a, sub a suburb out on Long Island, 21 miles east of Manhattan. Um, dad was from England, mom was from Texas, mm -hmm. and I have a young, younger brother, he's no longer on the planet. Um, <clears throat> from the age of about eight, mm -hmm. well, yeah, from about the age of eight, we used to do um, little dramas, you know, in our backyard, that type of thing, and I was always the producer of them, and the director, and very, very much a bully, because I always wanted the best role of the witches, or the queens, or... You know the, the the most important characters. Right. Um, yeah, I, I've always wanted to be an actor. There were there were temporary moments when I, for example, my dad when he came, my dad owned two travel agencies in Manhattan. Nice. Uh, one a whole, what we call a wholesale outfit, which packaged tours to the Caribbean, for which then got sold to retail outfits who sold them to the public. The other one was this great retail travel agency. And um, LaGuardia Airport was the only airport near us at the time. And uh, Father used to take us out. It was a thrill to us to go out to the airport and see planes come in and depart mm -hmm. and meet various friends of my parents. And uh, Jimmy and I always wanted to go on a plane. So one day Father said, get dressed, we're going to the air airport. In those days, we got dressed up. You know, was very dressed up, and you wore little white gloves and hats and things like that to, mm -hmm. to go to an airport. As simple as that. Um, and we asked who we were going to meet, and he said, "You'll see." And we got there, and we waited and waited, and then um, Father suddenly said, "Come with me." And we walked a certain way, and he handed tickets to somebody, and and we were ushered onto a plane, and it went. We sat down in a, well, we said, where are we going? And he said, Pittsburgh. And we went, why? He said, because you both wanted to fly. I thought you'd like to experience a flight. And it was so dramatic and so exciting for me because I, I looked at those stewardesses in and, and their smart uniforms with their little pillbox hats and their gloves. And I decided, oh, I'll, I'll, be, a, I'll be a stewardess. That was a momentary lapse in my wanting to be an actor. Um, <laughs> And then I went into the drama club, club in high school and discovered uh, 
the joy. I was the, the first play I did was some kind of a mystery. Mm -hmm. And the only person who was willing to play the role of of what was not really a corpse, but a person, a character who had to lie in a coffin right. throughout the second act, was me. Mm -hmm. So I had to lie in that coffin, and they had propped up the coffin so that the lid opened upstage, right, away from the audience's view, so they were able to put a wooden chuck, a little wooden block in that, to give, give me some air. Mm -hmm. So it's dim lighting, and just at the end of the second act, what happens is the lid of the coffin suddenly starts to rise. <laughs> <gasps> and the audience starts to gasp. <gasps> and then the ch kids and all the grown-ups start to scream, and, and it took a lot of control for me to get off my back onto my knees and then slowly propel that lid upwards and then slowly stand. Scared the hell out of everybody, but the thrill of it was profound and I knew I'd found my calling. Yeah, so I carried on, I carried on. Um, and when I went to, because everybody in Garden City, yeah. everybody in Garden City went to an Ivy League, well, everybody went to college. That was it, you had to go to college. And mom had gone to college, father being English, had gone for one year in England and hated it and quit. Mother had adored college in the United States and mom wanted me to go to college and use my brains. Um, <laughs> I went to Sweetbriar College in Virginia, which was like the Smith or the Wellesley of the South. And I loved it. It was a four year college for women. Mm -hmm. um, but. I was very involved with the theater group there. And in between my sophomore and junior years, they opened up a summer stock theater there and I auditioned for it. I got in mm -hmm. and uh, it was a season of comedy. And it was summer stock, so of course, you're working in props as well as playing the lead or you're working in costumes as well as playing a small role, whatever. But I discovered that God had given me a rubber face and some very good comedy timing. <laughs> and I realized I was wasting my father's money by staying in college. I knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be an actor. So at the end of the season, and Mom had come down to see me, um, I quit college. I drove back to, Man to, to Long Island and told Mother over cocktails and I quit college. Father was down in the Caribbean on a business trip. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I quit college. And mother heard all my reasons and what I was planning to do. And she said, pour me another martini, please, here, which I did. <laughs> and um, then she said, all right, we will not, I will not send a, this is 1956. Right. Before we had cell phones or email or anything. She said, I will not send a cable to your father. Um, he has enough business problems that, that are confronting him right now, so we'll wait till he comes home. So I started auditioning on Broadway for oh, what they call cattle calls for musical comedies. Right. Um, I... Every, every afternoon, every afternoon, I used, at 4.30, I used to race into the office of Irving Townsend at Columbia Records. He was a vice president there, whom I knew, and I would sit in front of Irving, saying, Irving, <laughs> <laughs> there hasn't been cast in anything yet, and he'd say, Pam, it's only been a week. Come on, give it some time, you know? Yeah. Have some patience, my dear. Um, three weeks after I quit college, I was out on a date. I called mom to tell her what time I'd be home, and she said, your father arrived home unexpectedly tonight. I've told him your news. He is not pleased. Therefore, get home fast. He will <laughs> talk to you at breakfast. And the following morning, my mother and my brother were out of the house at dawn. Father and I had breakfast together in the dining room, treating each other like rather like caged lions or tigers, mm -hmm. very politely. 
would you care for some more bacon, Father? No, thank you very much, Pamela. Uh, I would like a coffee, though, that type of thing. And finally, Father yeah. said, well, you've quit college. I told you you didn't need to go to college. You're a girl. I mean, girls just get married, but you're not getting married. You're going to be an actor. That's the worst possible profession for anybody. There is no security in that at all. I said, I know that. He said, well, how impressed are Broadway producers and television producers when you tell them you've had two years of liberal arts college at Sweetbriar? Yeah. Um, very. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> what do you plan to do? And I said, well, I just got a job at NBC, Rockefeller Center. I'm going to be a guide, and I'll wear a nifty uniform, and they'll pay me forty-eight ninety-five a week. <laughs> he went, what about an acting job? And I said, I just got the third understudy to the role of Luca in Arms and the Man by George Bernard Shaw off, 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 off Broadway. And how much does that pay? And I said, well... If I ever get on stage, I'll get three dollars a show. And he said, <laughs> "Go upstairs and get your passport." I said, "Why?" He said, "Go upstairs and get your passport." I said, "Why, Pamela? Get your passport." I ran upstairs, Tommy. Mm -hmm. Took me about ten minutes to find the passport. Came running downstairs. Father was just hanging up the phone. He hangs it up and he said, "All right." Now, this was Tuesday, Tommy, mm -hmm. August 14th, 11.30 in the morning, something that's burned in my brain. He said, okay, you're sailing on Friday on the SS United States for England. My cousin Guy Welby will meet you at the station, at Victoria Station, when the boat train comes in. You will be living with him and his wife, Molly. They will be your guardians. I think you will be more effective knocking on doors of drama schools yeah. rather than sending letters. And I would, I, well, I let out a scream, my dear, that you would hear at the end of Long Island. <laughs> and that's the moment that changed my life. Totally changed my life. Wow, that is I went, amazing. I went to, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, for a dad who had nothing to do with show business and a mom who had nothing to do with show business, that was incredible support, amazing support. We were not, my parents were not rich people. They were comfortably middle class, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was extraordinary. And I was both, I was in the, for three years, the three year, you know, session at uh, WADA. Mm -hmm. and I got into the Royal Academy. And um, Susanna York was in the class ahead of me. Um, wow. Hero Two was in the two terms ahead of me. Um, so was Sean Phillips, who was, became his wife, and then latterly they divorced. Um, also, Brian Bedford was in at the Rada at the time. I mean, all kinds of marvelous performer, performers, people who became marvelous performers were there. And I loved it. I absolutely adored it. And when I started, it was interesting because the, the, the voice teacher said, Pamela, what do you intend to do with your career when you graduated from NADA? I said, well, I'll go back to New York, you know, and I'll work on Broadway, and I'll probably work, you know, go out to Hollywood, and I'll work in Hollywood in the films. And she said, you don't intend to pursue a career yeah, in England, and I went, no, 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 I'm going back to the States. And she said, well, I would suggest, my dear, that if you are going to pursue a career, you really should lose some of that nasality, and I think we need to put you someplace in the midst of the Atlantic. Shall we begin, dear? And that's how she started working with me. She was marvelous. Yeah. So I did that course, but guess what? Uh -huh. In 1957, in May, at the beginning of the spring term, mm -hmm. on, at the beginning of every term, you always had a big assembly where the principal of the school would greet everyone, and the entire staff would be sitting up on the stage, and the entire, all the classes were there, right? All the years, all the years. And yeah. when we walked into that, assembly that particular May day, there 
There are lights and cameras and microphones. And of course, we budding actors were all we started cleaning like idiots, going, Hello, darling, how are you? That type of thing. Yeah. And the principal spoke to us and welcomed us. And then at the conclusion of his regular speech, he said, Well, you've undoubtedly noticed those cameras here, microphones, and lights. The National Film Board of Canada is making a documentary about a Canadian girl who's in the second term right now. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to need some of you to play the roles of students. They will pay you a quid per night. You will work from 5 p.m. till 10 p.m. And I expect you to be in class the following day. Don't think I will allow you to forget to do your homework, all right? I did not need money. My father was supporting me. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I was supposed to go that night to my guardians, because by this time, I, my parents had moved me into uh, an all-female um, situation for young women of the Commonwealth and the occasional yank could get in. Mm -hmm. um, I was bringing, I was in, get engaged to a Swiss boy at that point, and I was going to bring the Swiss boy to meet my guardians. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to be in the movie. And so I canceled the dinner party at my guardians. I went to the audition. I was cast. I worked the next, the next few nights in the film. Mm -hmm. And when the film wrapped, two weeks from then, from the beginning, at the wrap party, the Canadian cinematographer, John C. Foster, mm -hmm. was talking to me and the school electrician about the history of the National Film Board. And we were at a wrap party, so needless to say, well, Tommy, you know what wrap parties are like, they're very noisy. Yes. <laughs> so John Foster, yeah, right? Right. So John Foster didn't hear him. So John said, let's go into the bathroom and we can hear each other speak. And in England in those days, a bathroom did not have a toilet in it. A bathroom was simply a sink and a bathtub. The toilet was always in a separate room by itself called the WC, water closet, right? right? So we go into the bathroom and we lock the door. Each of us has one glass of wine. We are not pissed as newts. We're sober as judges. <laughs> the cinematographer sits down in the bathtub. The young electrician and I sit down on the floor and the cinematographer continues his monologue about the film board. And then 45 minutes into his monologue, he suddenly stops and says, Hey, Pam, how'd you like to be my wife? And I went, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't even dated. He said, I know. I don't know you well enough to say I love you, but I think we could have an interesting life together. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> and I went, are you joking? But no, I'm very serious. Now that is not the kind of invitation that will lead to a lifetime marriage. It just isn't. It, it, so I had to think about it, right? Right. So two minutes later, I said yes, and that's how I came to Canada. Wow, that is pretty yeah. amazing. I have I, to say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And so we, the National Film Board of Canada was then headquartered in Montreal. That was 1957. Mm -hmm. um, we were married in August of that year, and we lived in the Laurentians up in a fabulous ski, um, ski lodge. Not a ski lodge, but a ski shack, as we call them. And um, in January of 58, mm -hmm. John and his crew were assigned to three months of shooting three different films for television in Toronto. So I came with John, and on the first night we were in Toronto, we went to what was then the Celebrity Club, and John introduced me to all of the actors who were there, because they had all worked with the film board, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody knew Johnny. And that night when we got back to the hotel we were staying in, he gave me the list of all the drama producers at CBC Television, and 
I said, I've worked with every one of these guys. Pick up the phone tomorrow, call them, say you're Johnny Foster's new wife, you've just been at RADA, you're very talented, and they should hire you. And that's what I did, and they did. And that's how I started working right away. Wow. So let's. I know. <laughs> it was a very different world, my dear. 1957, yeah. not with 1958, sorry. Yeah. And, and so my first stage show was that summer, and mm-hmm. guess who directed it? Norman Jewison. Wow, yeah. Norman Jewison. <laughs> that is pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah. What was he like? He was delightful. He was absolutely marvelous. He's a wonderful, wonderful stage director. He's a wonderful TV and film director. He's, he was a total treat to work with. He really was. I was so great, grateful to work with him, and I worked with him the following summer, too, at, on another musical review. Mm-hmm. which went to Stratford as well. Yeah, what, 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 darling. What, what are your proudest moments on stage? Like, uh, like, what plays have you done that you're the most proud of? Hmm. I would think uh, 1977 Stratford Festival, Shakespearean Festival, the play Hay Fever, mm-hmm. in which I played the American divorcee, Myra Arundel. Yeah. Play is by Noel Coward, and uh, wonderful Dame Maggie uh, Maggie Smith starred in it. Starred in it. She played Judith the lead role. Yeah. And um, she was, it was heaven to work with her. She was just so amazing, so amazing. Yeah, that one. And the other play that I absolutely adored was um, Lost in Yonkers by Neil Simon. I did that in 1986. Mm-hmm. Shamanis. Theater Festival uh, out in um, on Vancouver Island, yeah, and that playing the grandmother, which oh man, it it was hard because she's a tough old broad. She's really can seems to be very mean, and I I tell you, I palpably felt the animosity from the audience, you mm-hmm. know, and and. It was fascinating because so many people who would come to the theater would come backstage to the stage door afterwards and say, I have to tell you, you reminded me of my awful grandmother or my awful mother. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I got that. I just decided I don't want to play that role again. Yeah. (laughs) It's it's tangible. You can feel the anger and the hatred coming across uh, the the, the footlights, or there's no footlights, of course, but across the stage, it's just dreadful. <laughs> yeah. I don't like that. I'm very, I'm very sensitive to that kind of shit. Pardon the vernacular. Oh, you can swear all you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was, so, uh, was, was it a decision on your part to do um, mostly uh, stage work and then later on in life do on-camera stuff? No, I started on camera. I started on camera in January of 1958. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first, my first shoot was Tugboat Annie. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember what I played in that. Um, and and then what I did was I did a lot of I did a oh I know what I did. I did a whole bunch of um, let me see no, no that's no, 59 50 that was 58. Yeah, 58 in 1958. And I did, in 59, I did a whole lot of uh, General Motors. The CBC had a, had, CBC had a live drama. They had wonderful hour-long drama shows, original, like Bernie Slade, Bernard Slade. Mm-hmm. He wrote, same time next year, he wrote Tribute, you know, that Jack Lemmon great movie. Um, yeah. And he wrote all kinds of wonderful dramas uh, and light comedies. Uh, I did a number of his his TV dramas. Um, I did um, I did children shows. Um, I did a whole lot of things like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I oh I know what in '58 since I did the, the musical with Norman Jewison, one of the writers for that was Ray Jessel, mm-hmm. and Ray Jessel. I loved doing his material. And there was a young Australian performer, a baritone, named Jimmy Hannon, who he and I worked together in certain sketches, and we just had a field day working together. So 
we decided to write a, do a nightclub act together in 1959, and we got ready to write the entire thing. It was all comedy in song, right? Right. right. And we were both bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. <laughs> <laughs> and so we opened here in Toronto at a brand new nightclub. We we were the opening act for the uh, for a, a wonderful black singer named Lonnie Satin. He was. Um, if you couldn't get Nat King Cole, you got Latin, Lonnie Satin to be your performer, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, and we got rave reviews. We were called the Nichols and May of music. We nice. were called the uh, Ford and Hines of Canada. If these names resonate in any way with you, I don't know. You may be much too young for this. <laughs> but at any rate, um, and then... The only person in this town who in those days booked clubs around Canada booked us up into clubs in northern Quebec and northern Ontario in mining towns. Mm -hmm. Well, sweetheart, the miners were all from Quebec, Portugal, and Italy. And we're doing comedy in song. They didn't understand a word we were saying or singing. (laughs) <laughs> they loved our enthusiasm, but they didn't get the jokes. They didn't get the humor at all. The only people who laughed were the wonderful, um, the wonderful people called the bands, right? The bands loved what we did because yeah. they were from English Canada. And then in 1959, I did another musical review with Norman Jewison, and then I was down in Manhattan. I was visiting my parents. And a hotelier, a friend of my parents, invited me to go to dinner with him at Ed Hurleyhee's home out on Long Island. Ed Hurleyhee, in, in the 50s and 60s, Ed Hurleyhee was a voice and face and spokesperson for craft, every craft product that they made, craft cheese, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. He was the spokesperson, the Perry Como show, wherever it was. So we were at dinner at, at Ed Hurleyhee's home. Tid Caesar was there with his wife all sorts of interesting people. And in those days, you have to understand, I don't know why you have to, but I'm asking you to understand, the Pam Hyatt, um, my husband called me his child bride. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a good actor, and I played the role of child bride. Hi, I'm Pam (laughs) Hyatt. I'm Johnny Foster's wife. How are you? You know, that type of midwit behavior, which some people found fascinating. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't, but never mind. I, that was the role that was being asked of me to play, you know. And so I'm from that generation which took direction from the man who was most prominent in her life. Okay? Mm-hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, Ed Hurley and the people at that dinner said, you shouldn't be up in Canada. You should be down in New York. And I told them about the act that Jimmy and I had all this comedy and song, and Ed said, send me a kinescope, and I will take it to my managers. His managers were Bullet Durbin and Ray Katz. They managed Jackie Gleason, they managed Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet, they managed Ed, they managed some big top performers, right? Mm -hmm. So home I went, and I sent the kinescope of Jimmy's and my act down to them, and um, suddenly I get a phone call. Pam Hyatt, this is Dulles Durbin. Come on down, we want to talk to you and Jimmy. Bring him down with you. We've got a proposal to make. Okay, okay. <laughs> we jump on a plane. This is 19, fall of 1959. We arrive in their office, and what they propose is this. Mm-hmm. All right. We'd like to represent you, you very talented kids. What we'll do is this. We will hire all the writers for your act. We'll choose the costumes. Mm-hmm. We'll choose the bands. You will be performing 38 weeks of each year in nightclubs across the United States. You will also be doing television guest appearances. We will be paying you a weekly salary. Mm-hmm. What, and it's a seven-year contract. What do you say? <laughs> and we just stared at each other and said, well, Jimmy's married, and his wife is pregnant, and I'm married, and my my husband's not pregnant, but I mean, we need to go back and talk to our 
wife and husband. We get back on the plane, and have you ever heard the expression, choiceless choice? No, not really. Well, that was it. There was no choice to be made. Mm -hmm. If we wanted our marriages to survive, how in God's name could we do that if we're traveling yeah. 38 weeks of the year? Hello? <laughs> I ask you a very simple question. You can't survive a marriage. A marriage will not survive that. Yeah. And we both wanted our marriages to survive, and especially Jimmy with the baby coming, you know? Yeah. So we turned him down. Um, that was in 1959. 1960, uh, 1960, I had a summer television show. I was a comedian, a regular comedian on it. Mm -hmm. And that was great fun. It was called Swing Gently. Uh, a lot of the stuff is not listed in, a lot of the CBC stuff is not listed on, on uh, IMDb. Yeah. At any rate. Yeah, really a drag. But at any rate, um, my my earliest. I, mem doing, I, was gonna, I was gonna say my earliest memory of you was the hilarious scene right. you had in Police Academy Three. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> now, what year was that again? The, the Police Academy Three. Where are we? That would be in the eighties. That's in the eighties. Yeah. The there East, it is. Nineteen eighty-six. Right. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Jerry Paris was a very interesting guy to work for. Not a friendly person, not a friendly Oh, yeah, I've heard. <laughs> I interviewed yeah. his daughter a couple of years ago, and um, she gave me a lot of I don't know, and I, I kept thinking to myself, why, why did you agree to do this if you don't know a lot of stuff, right? And she had told me that she tried to get her brothers to uh, come in and join in and stuff, and they didn't want to do it. And at the end, I asked her, uh, have you ever thought about about researching him and writing a book about about him? And she was like, "No, that's your job." And then that's when I thought to myself, "Oh my God, it must have been a really bad relationship they all had." <laughs> you know. I think it was. It was not a happy camper place. It just wasn't. Yeah. There was a wonderful thing I did in that same year. I did Act of Vengeance with Charles. Charles, well, Charles Bronson. Bronson. Yeah. And Luther Brimley and and Keanu Reeves had a very tiny role. Yeah. Um, but I tell you, at Charles Bronson was without a doubt the most generous actor mm -hmm. I had ever worked with. Um, there he was, the star. There was a, I can't even remember the role that I played, right? Um, right. But I, there was a scene where there were like five of us. It was a very heavy drama. Right. And there's a scene where there's Charles and then five of us. And each person has a lot to say, right? right. So, of course, you do the master shot. Then, you, of course, they do Charles. Charles is close-ups. And the last person who gets they do, whose close-ups they do is me. Because I have the smallest number of lines, but they have to get the close-ups of, of me. Mm -hmm. And Charles stayed throughout everybody's close-ups. He didn't walk away and have an AD or a script assistant to do the lines for him. He stayed and gave us full value, mm -hmm. which I loved. I just absolutely loved. That was so generous and so kind. There's um, a nice story. This is not about me, but it is a wonderful actress in Canada named Lally Cadeau. She did a, a movie in the 80s. It was, would have been 1982. Mm -hmm. um, and it was with, it was a movie of the week with Carol Burnett and Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. And Lally was playing the owner of a bookstore where the Elizabeth character was working. And uh, Lally has to chew out, really tear strips off of the Elizabeth character for not doing the work properly. Right. So they do the master, they do the medium shot, and now they go in for Elizabeth's close-ups. And now they repo camera <laughs> and they're going to go for for uh, Lally's close-ups. And Elizabeth does not walk away and leave it up to a script assistant to do the read. She stays right there. And now the, the first AD says, okay, we're ready. Mm -hmm. And Elizabeth says, no, you're not. And the director said, what? She said, you're not ready to shoot Lally's close-up. He said, what do you mean? She said, you haven't changed the light the key light is still on me. Turn it around and put it on Lally now. I mean, now that's called generous, eh? Yeah. That's, 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 
That's very yeah. generous, I have to say, yeah. But, uh, yeah, going back to what you were saying about your rubber face, yeah, in that scene in Police Academy 3, you know, Leslie Easterbrook says she's going to make a, a woman out of your daughter by giving her a set of brass balls this big. Your face is just priceless. <laughs> Yeah, I have had a lot of comments on that, yes. As I say, God gave me a rubber face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you did a, um, a a classic horror movie called Killer Party. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Um, did you see it? Did you see it? Oh, yes. Um, I interviewed... I've never seen it. Yeah, I interviewed one actress in it a couple of years ago, Elaine Wilkes. Um, who is now doing self-help um, healing and stuff now. And, um, yeah, William Fruitt, he was a, a, a pretty good uh, uh, underrated horror filmmaker, I thought. He was very good. And bless his heart, I mean, um, when I was cast for this, mm -hmm. as you know, my character has to be killed. Yeah. And... Um, so they had me go into the FX trailer and lie on a table, and I had to. Uh, they, they put water in my my mouth was op open, and I had to breathe through my nose as they put poured water into my mouth, and I had to keep the water in my mouth um, the entire time for like five minutes and to just see if I was going to freak out or anything, I, which I didn't. And then, of course, they, what they did is they took a mold of my open mouth, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, this is something you wouldn't have seen. Um, so they took a, take a mouth, because I was battered to death in the head with a cricket um, bat. Or, what do you call them, cricket? It's not a bat. What do they call them, cricket? It's not a wicket either. Uh. Cricket. Yeah. Anyway, it's a big wooden pa a cricket paddle. It's not a paddle. I don't know the proper word. I'm sorry. It's okay. And anyway, so then after doing that, they said, no, and they also, um, they said, you're going to have a cut on your ch left cheek. No, is it left cheek? And you're going to have mealy worms on your tongue. <laughs> and so they've taken um, a prosthetic pest taking a wax impression of my screaming open mouth, right? Ah, type of thing. <laughs> yeah. And we were going to make a prosthetic of my screaming open mouth. And they said, do you like mealy worms? I said, I don't remember me meeting any mealy worms. They took me over to a jar in the fridge and opened it, and there were all these little tiny white things crawling around, very, 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 very tiny. And they said... We'll just be squeezing some drops of spirit gum onto the make-believe tongue that will be in your open mouth, and then we'll be putting a mealy worm on each of the spirit gum drops. I went, cool, that's fine. <laughs> so when the scene is thought about to happen in the basement of that house, that empty house where they're having the party upstairs, and my corpse has got to be downstairs. Yeah. They, they, I, my corpse has got to be six months old. So they did all the aging and matting of the hair and the aging of the arms because I was in a short sleeved dress. And then they had me open my mouth and they glued the prosthetic uh, onto my lips. And of course, it's. It, it goes all the way into my mouth, you know, and it's replicating and colored. It looks just like my mouth screaming. Mm -hmm. And they, of course, had also done a, a prosthetic thing, a, a, a scar thing on my left cheek. And now they do the spirit gum. And it, you have to really breathe through your nose with this one. They do the spirit gum and they do the little meeting rooms. And I can't see it. There's no mirror. I'm not looking at a mirror. It's so fun. Yeah. Now they walk. They walk me out into the basement, which is full of all those make-believe cobwebs and Fuller's dust, right? Mm -hmm. And the crew were all masked because of the Fuller's dust. Take one look at me and nearly throw up. Um, <laughs> of course, I can't see it. 
because there are these goddamn worms wiggling around on my tongue and on my cheek, right? And I sit down in this big chair, camera is directly in front of me, and Bill Fruitt uh, calls for action, or his first AD does, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the lead couple come down the stairs and start walking along the path, pathway in the main part of that cellar. And I am supposed to be dead. I'm limp as a, I just am totally limp and cold, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, here's what I do. You go through and say, cut, what? <laughs> she says, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> and the photographer says, she's trying to tell you there's a worm on her tongue. Yeah. yeah. So, FX comes running over. They lift up the prosthetic in my mouth. One of the worms has found a little tiny hole in the tongue part of my prosthetic and it's crawled down through the little hole onto my real tongue. So they tweeze the little bugger off, we yeah. glue it, we start again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 uh. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you, Bill Ford, I've never seen a man so angry. Never seen a man so angry. Even, happened, more, even more angry than Jerry Paris? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, probably the same degree, but Jerry Paris never had the right to be angry, whereas Mr. Pruitt did have the right to be angry. Mm-hmm. Jerry Paris got... Yeah. Uh, he, was, he, was a, he was a bully boy. He was a bully boy. Yeah, that's what I've been told. Yeah. I um, uh, yeah, I I grew I grew up loving uh, Care Bears movie two and New Generation. That was fun. That was so much fun. The voice I used for that for Noble Heart Horse mm-hmm. was a voice in which I always read when he, I read the character of Winnie the Pooh to first Carson T. Foster, who was my firstborn son, yeah. the child of Johnny and myself. And Carson's a, a rigging grip. He's out in B.C. And um, then, of course, to Zach Ward, my actor son, who was in L.A. I've interviewed yeah. Zach, yeah. Pardon? I interviewed Zach a couple years ago. Yes, I know. You mentioned that in your in your first reach out to me. Thank you, thank you. And yeah. he's a wonderful actor. He's I when when he was doing when he was I was living in Vancouver from ninety nine until two thousand six. Yeah. And when Zach was doing Titus, I used to watch that show, and I nearly fell off my chair. I kept saying, "How in God's name did you do that?" I mean, he mm-hmm. was fearless in his comedy in his choices, absolutely fearless. Um, he just completely committed to it yeah. and went. I love the character. I love the character that he played. I just adored him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's a very talented actor, as he, you know. He is very talented, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just love the, I love the message of... Um, uh, the, of all the Care Bear stuff, but this uh, particular movie, I just always loved. I talked to Allison Court, who did the voice of one of the camp, uh, one of the campers, and stuff. And yeah, it's just got it's got a very sweet message to it, you know, about you know, it, there's no win or lose, you know, everyone can can be a, a, a camp champ, as they said in the movie. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's wonderful when. I find I find it's wonderful when um, when you're something you do in animation has a genuine message to it that is uh, I, I I never had done real violent stuff until I moved to Vancouver and then I ended up doing a lot of violent stuff and I don't want to do that anymore. Yeah. Um, but I did a, I don't know if you ever saw it because your, your favorite period is the 80s as I understand, but mm-hmm. um, I did an incredible series called Silver Wings um, huh. out in Vancouver. Oh, about it's based on all those on the first book of the uh, about that fat colony and it's so I played the ancient one the ancient one who's in charge the ancient her name is Frida and I just loved it it was so ennobling and it was so it was so strengthening and so 
powerful, the whole thing. It was so kind and, and caring. It was really, really caring, and I, I love that. I really I love that, yeah. What else intrigued you that I did in those days? Anything else? You played um, Joyce Selznick in the Anne Julian story. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, that was fun to do, yeah. Yeah, did you do any research on her? Oh, well, I worked with her, and I did research on Joyce, yeah. 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 Is, is Angelian a nice lady to work with? She was lovely. With me, she was lovely. Very, very charming. I had a wonderful time. Yeah. Nice. Not a problem. Yeah, she was very, very nice. You were you were in the final episode of the Alfred Hitchcock Presents reboot. It was a parody of North by Northwest called South by Southeast. <laughs> <laughs> what what was the name of that one again? South by Southeast. Right, and that was in the eighties still, right? Yeah, that was in eighty nine. Um, let me see if I've got it here. Uh, Patrick Wayne. South by Southeast, right? Albert Hitchcock, no, that's not in. Uh, where is that? South by Southeast, little. I don't even see it. What year? What, what year was it? Eighty-nine. I, I think it was eighty-nine. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. Here's the thing. Mm-hmm. It was when we did when we did Care Bears. We managed. To, most of the time to be in a room with a lot of our fellow performers. Then right. it started changing. So you weren't in a room with a lot of fellow performers. Yeah. Um, I loved doing, I did droids, but I also did... Um, Ewoks. Yeah, Ewoks. I adored doing Aunt Bozzy. I absolutely adored doing that. That was so much fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was enormous fun. I loved her character. Because she was such a silly Billy, and she always did pratfalls. I mean, I just loved doing pratfalls, yeah, and making total asses of herself, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and always yeah, being silly. Yeah, she was great. Um, I don't remember anything about South by Southeast. I just don't remember it. Mm-hmm. Has Has anyone? Um, I was going to say, has any, Has anyone ever invited you to to uh, comic cons because you've done voices for cartoon stuff? I've never been invited. Nope. Nope. Never. Huh, that's oh. interesting. So many people are doing them, you know, you know, before quarantine happened. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, Jim Bond actually directed me in South by Southeast. That's right. I remember that. That's a, That was 89 and that one. Let me see. Yeah, I, Jim had directed me in a musical, a stage musical that I did back in... Mm, 75, 75, yeah, um, yeah, and then Tim directed me again, I loved working for him, um, he directed me in 2000, he directed me in a Christmas movie that I absolutely adored doing in uh, 2000 and, what would it have been, 2013, I think, mm-hmm. 2013, yeah, in which I played the richest woman in New York who owns a TV station and uh, every year holds a, a contest uh, called Christmas Song and it's a contest where two uh, singers from high schools across New York City compete as mm-hmm. duets, doing duets. And this woman is so silly. She's <laughs> so over the top. And she's so extravagant and she's absolutely convinced that she knows more about the arts than anybody in the world. Yeah. Which, of course, she doesn't, but never mind. Um, and my favorite direction from Tim was, just before we started shooting, my entrance was in a TV studio in one of the... I was going to enter from one of those gigantic elevators where they move all the sets and equipment, you know, that is, like two stories high, right? Right. And so he got into the elevator with me, closed the door, and he said, I have one note for you, Pam. And I said, what is it? He said, take over. And I went, you got it. I can. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> that was nice. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. I should not be talking so much. <laughs> it's okay. They want to hear you, not me. <laughs> 
so in this in this time of uh, quarantine, how are things? Do you uh, plan on going back to work? You know, if if, if um, a, a oh, cure yes. has been so, made. I, I live at the performing I live at the Performing Arts Lodge in Toronto, mm-hmm. which was the first one across Canada, and we opened it in 1993 when I first moved in here, and uh, I moved out to Vancouver in '99 in order to work in film there. But um, I came back here in 2011, and I adore it. And as my sons know, this is where I will live, and they will. The next time I move out, will be in a body bag. <laughs> um, I'm 80, turning 85 this April, which is a wonderful year. I'm very energetic. Uh, take lots of exercise classes. I just started a jazz, ba- a jazz progressive, you know, a jazz based class online. Obviously, uh, doing it on Zoom. Yeah. Um, but it's a nice to get back to dancing because I haven't done that for a long time. Um, and I take voice classes all the time from Alan Reed. And uh, let me see, last year uh, I had just shot four very funny commercials for McDonald's in which I play the oldest, <laughs> the <laughs> oldest, um, what do you call it, employee they'll ever have. And like when I walked into the audition, and I'm known for my energy and in my enthusiasm, when I walked into the audition, the director, a nice English guy, said, Pam, darling, I don't want any enthusiasm. I don't want any energy. Yeah. Let's pretend we're doing a documentary about you, all right? So I want it very understated. Can you give me understated? <laughs> and I thought for a moment and said, yeah, I can, which I did. So I was cast, and there were four that we shot in one day, and I worked with these two darling young men, aged 19 and 21, and we had a field day doing it. We shot it in late January. We shot the four of them in late January. And then, of course, they <laughs> COVID ran into town and into the country in late February. Mm-hmm. So they never went up on air, right? Yeah. We're paid for them, of course, for the, at least their sessions. Um, and there was no work at all uh, for me until December of this, this past December, where I did something for the Missioner Institute for the int- on their internet uh, website, uh, which is all about agent hands, the difficulty they have in removing batteries from a channel you know, a channel changer, you know, for your television. Yeah. Uh, the difficulty the old ha- old people's hands have in unscreened drawers. Remote control. However, here's, the good, here's the good news. I've just booked to do a very lovely Christmas movie, which I'm shooting in March. So I'm very happy about that, and it's a neat role. I'm very, very tickled. Love it. Love it. Oh my God! I'm so Thanks. glad you got all that. You got all that great stuff going for you, Pam. And yes, I can tell that uh, you're very energetic. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> I just hope Zach, as you know, Zach wrote. You know the movie that Zach wrote called Renovation. I heard of it. Yeah. Did you watch it? I haven't seen it yet. No. Well, you should because I he wrote a cameo for me. And he directed me to a really moving performance, a very moving performance. So I'm hoping Zach will write me into some more movies when when it's time for when we can cross borders and do things like that. Yeah, that would be fun. I'd love to work with him again. Oh, that's so sweet. I was curious, Pam, um, what's what's your favorite curse word? F-U-C-K. Yes, same here. <laughs> it's either. But it's, I don't mean. Really, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I don't get very upset. I never use um, anything rough, rough, rougher than that. You know. Yeah. Well, it's, I, I don't even think you can go rougher than that, really. Uh, in in terms of anger. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. As far as women are concerned, you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you start dating women's body parts, you, you're, you're getting into some very bad territory. You Bo- know? Body parts. <laughs> that's, very, that's, that's very offensive. Very, very offensive. Yeah. I, 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 never mind. So much has changed in the past. Yeah. Years. So much has changed. 
How, you're obviously well. You, you sound enthusiastic about life, and you look enthusiastic on your your um, on your website. I tr- I try to be. I try to be. I mean, I've I've been through a lot the last few years. I had a bad car accident in 2015, and that's what led to uh, me starting the podcast uh, because I was just, I was taking life for granted, you know. And but I'm just I'm just so emotional over what we've all been going through, you know. It's just you know I hope my hard work you know doesn't go to waste. It's not going to, and you know something as Un, as uh, unpleasant as a lot of people would view a car accident as unfair. You know something? If that car accident woke you up, pussy cat, to mm. recognizing the miracle of each moment and the yeah. preciousness of being in the human body, by God, by heaven, by nirvana, by whatever you want to call it, sweetheart, uh-huh. you should be blessing that car accident and saying, thank you so much. That suffering brought me to where I am right now in appreciation for life. It is such a gift. It's so beautiful. It's so scrumptious. And we should never take it for granted, Tommy. And I'm so glad you don't. This is just lovely. Your work will be appreciated. I'm sure of it. I'm sure it is. Oh, thank you. Yes. I mean, I've done, you know, um, you know, uh, 1,100 plus interviews now, and it's just been a, a great gift to me. And I got, you know, more on the way to keep going. And yeah, I mean, I, I look at the accident as a gift, and I don't look at it in any negative terms at all. Good, good, good man. Very good man. Very good. So you you focus primarily on... The 1980s, right? That's what you I understand. Eight eighties is my primary focus, but I like to, you know, go go past that every now and then and stuff. I like to talk about the sixties and the seventies, you know, and sometimes the nineties, um, but uh, not a whole lot of uh, current stuff unless you know the person uh, wants to talk about a, a current project they're doing. I have no problem with that. Right. I'm wondering if you know a Canadian actor named Mackenzie Gray. Mackenzie Gray, I Check him out. Sh- I should. I know so. Ma- I know so many Canadian actors. I should know uh, Mackenzie Gray. <laughs> yeah, he's he's prolific. He's out in Vancouver. He started in Toronto, but he's he's been primarily based out in Vancouver, and he's an incredible actor with an amazing roster of uh, credits, um, and he's. And he has—he <laughs> was diagnosed with um, whatever that kind of special diabetes is. When you're told, okay, you're going to have to have insulin shots every single day, and his parents just got him down and said, okay. And he, yeah. when he was a kid, he was still showing, showing this. And they said, if there's no point in grousing about it. This is the way you're going to have to live, and you're going to have to be diligent about it, etc. Mm-hmm. And um, and so he did that. But I mean as his sister has written on Facebook, occasionally when he was in his 20s and living over in London for a while, um, he was uh, didn't quite practice what he was supposed to do. But at any rate, um, he's had a number of near, near calls, and then finally, this past winter, he had to have his uh, uh, one leg removed from, um, you know, the, the knee down. Mm-hmm. And his posts on Facebook are the most inspiring blessed things I've ever seen in my life with such a sense of humor and the people who have worked with him and that he's worked with and his tales, his stories are fabulous. He would be a marvelous person for you to interview. I think you'd love him. I think you'd absolutely love him. Check him out. I will definitely check him out on on Facebook um, and and reach out to him because he is just so talented and I'm sure there's some stuff. It's his major work in the 80s was, he's much younger than me, um, he's Carson's, he's Carson's age, he's just in his early 60s, right? He's just turned 60. Um, uh, his major work in the 80s was theater. But then, boom, film, 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 TV, 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 film, 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 voice, 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 film, 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 film. Mm-hmm. Um, tons of stuff, really good stuff. And I think he's, yeah, lots of exciting stuff dramatic stuff, scary stuff, major scary stuff. 
which you like, right? You like horror. Yeah, right? I love horror. Yeah. I'll yeah. De- I'll definitely do, check do, him do, out. Do, yeah, do, do, do take a look at his, his IMDb. Yeah. All right. Okay. It's lovely talking with you, Tommy. It's, a, it's such a pop it to call me. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure, Pam. Thank you so much. And um, stay safe, and I'll see you on Facebook. Definitely. Let's communicate on Facebook on a regular basis, and, and yes. stay well, because you can. Oh, there's, see, I, I did the, in 1998, I, there's a movie called Dream House, uh-huh. in which I played, uh, it was a terror film. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So the, I, I, was, I was the voice of the house. Always oh, terrifying. That was like how in 2001, right? Right. Yeah. yeah, but that's, you haven't seen it, I'm sure. At any rate. I'll check okay. it out. I will stop talking so you can get on to other things and interview other people, my darling. Okay? Okay. You have a great day. I'm having it already. You've made it very special. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you, my thank pleasure. You have, thank you. I'm honored that you called me. I really am, Tommy. Oh. You have yourself a great day again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't think of I other know. words to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're fine, both of us. Let's dance on, okay? Okay. <laughs> and you, you stay well, my son. I will. I will. Okay. Bye-bye. Blessings upon your noble head. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, darling. Well, there you have it. Pam Hyatt. Ain't she a sweetheart? Nice lady. Oh, my God. Very passionate about what she does. I'm so glad she's doing so well, even later in life. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>